एवरेज विल गिव अ स्मॉल इंट्रोडक्शन ओके एक गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन आई एम सात्विक कृष्णा इट्स माई प्लेजर टू वेलकम डॉक्टर अलोक पांडे ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ शोभा मिश्रा हु इज अ रीडिंग साइकैट्रिस्ट हु हैज इम्पैक्टेड मेनी लाइफ ही इज अ वेल नोन पर्सनैलिटी वर्ल्ड वाइड He has settled as an ashramite at Sri Aurobindo Ashram Pondicherry. I am thankful that he has agreed to deliver a talk on freedom from stress. Mama, you can. Thank you, Satvik. I have no words. I am running short of words to introduce Alok. Only thing I can tell you. that it is a grace of god that he is present in front of you all anything from you hello <laughs> okay <laughs> i think i'll i'll kind of self introduce which i got used to so i am i am your shobha ma'am's younger brother uh, only brother and she has been a wonderful person Uh, a dear friend and of course the most wonderful sister and uh, we both have grown up together shared many memories as far as i am concerned yes i move around speak a lot write a lot on different subjects gone all over the world sharing the vision and work of shri bindu and the mother um, i i have worked with the indian air force uh, for 20 years retired as a wing commander and uh, now i am settled in shirbindu ashram pondicherry which uh, satvik has already said uh, i have written a few books but um, i love to share uh, a deeper greater vision of life future life and how the present can move towards the future in the light of my master shirbindu and the mother all right i think that's good enough ji ji <laughs> Hey, yeah. Yeah. Uh, one thing I love is humility, and very honestly, I am acknowledging in front of everybody. I have learnt a lot and lot from him. To be very honest, I I consider him to be my guru. I have changed my life because of him. Thank you, Alu. Okay, Ji Ji. Huh. So, shall we start? Yes, you can start. <clears throat> namaste i think the subject is freedom from stress if we look at life one thing we can be very sure of and it is this that life is perpetually changing and as long as this change is taking place at a very small level at a slow pace it's okay but this change takes sometimes a leap A leap across time, time, and when this happens, it's not just a change, but an unexpected change. So, two things in life which we can almost say with certainty: one is that change is the way of life, law of life, and second, we can say with as much certainty that uncertainty is the only thing certain about life. All right. So, essentially, this change, as long as it is, is a slow pace. it doesn't generate stress or be able to handle it when the change is sudden unexpected it may be a good change bad change that's not how we uh, understand the body the mind doesn't look at it like that this suddenness and unexpectedness does create a kind of stress this is the first thing we need to understand second is stress is a lot to do with our perception about ourselves and our life so 
if we understand life correctly, if we understand the real sense of the events and circumstances about things that are happening in our life, it takes away the sting of stress. For example, let's take an example of the Gita. Arjuna is under great stress. He's a great warrior and it's not difficult for him to fight this battle at all. Yet he's under stress because he's called upon to do something which he has never done till now against his own very own people and where death, massacre, all these things may be involved. And his own inner idealism recalls and revolts. So there are two levels of stress. One is stress, which is very external and the automatic habitual reactions of our being. Second, where it is very internal, where the stress is stress of choices, whether I should choose this or I should choose that. So this stress of choices creates a kind of internal conflict. And since we as human beings do not like to live in a state of conflict, it generates stress. In fact, we can say with as an axiomatic truth that uncertainty creates greater stress than a certain danger. So that's where we see that in Arjuna's crisis, there is a stress, but all stress, when we look at it very closely, is essentially an evolutionary process, meaning thereby, as long as we are not called upon to the change, as long as change is very little, we evolve very slowly. Life gets caught into a habitual mechanical routine. And while it's all right, you know, it may be reassuring to be in a kind of comfort zone, yet within life, there is ingrained, inbuilt, an urge to evolve. And this urge to evolve, in other words, this changes the direction. This urge to evolve can be experienced as quest, seeking, aspiration, wishes, desires, imaginations, ambitions, call it whatever. As human beings, we are programmed to evolve. And this evolution can take one of the two lines. One is evolution along the lines of desire. And second is evolution along the lines that we are meant to evolve. In other words, there is a kind of programming within life wherein it should evolve towards greater and greater possibilities. And if we look at the uh, whole creation, the whole evolutionary process from dust to man, we'll see essentially in life, the evolutionary programming is to grow towards manifesting greater and higher capacities and potentials, which are within us. All education is a recognition of this evolutionary impulsion. And to understand life, we must catch this evolutionary thread, which runs as an undercurrent of life. When we do not catch it, we are compelled to evolve. We are shaken from our comfort zone. And when we are shaken from our comfort zone, we call it stress. In other words, stress is a challenge thrown by life to help us grow. It is not some mysterious God trying to punish us. It's not some law of karma wanting us to suffer or somebody wants us to you know, um, become miserable. It's none of these things. It comes, stresses come in a life because they want us to grow and evolve. And this growth and evolution is along two lines. One is evolution of knowledge. That means a right understanding, a truer understanding, a deeper understanding, a broader understanding of what life is. What am I doing here? What are these events and circumstances which appear so frightening? And the second is empowerment. It's not enough just to have knowledge. One should also gain power to overcome it. So these are the two essential faculties or capacities along which life evolves. And of course, at the core of it is love because an evolution without love is like an artificial intelligence. It has knowledge, it has power, but it is insane. It is destructive. And the second evolution is where you have not only knowledge and power, but love at the core. When there is love at the core, then it is divine intelligence or a spiritual intelligence. So human intelligence can grow along these two lines. One line where we stress upon a kind of knowledge and power, which is done at the expense of love, is a life of egoistic assertion. That's where ambition takes us, desire takes us, where we are completely concerned only with ourselves. And with nobody else. So a person who is extremely egoistic and selfish, he keeps on living only for himself till he reaches a point where he, he is all alone. And that's where life hits back and recoils because you cannot evolve beyond a point without this energy of love. Many people do that. They, in fact, 
say that no no love emotions this is not good so you must just you know fulfill your ambitions desires wants greed and we forget this core whereas another kind of evolution is where knowledge and love are like two wings of a bird but they are balanced on the body of love so this we must understand that in all processes of life whether it be facing stress or anything else one must always keep a heart of love and compassion at the core why because when we don't have it then we react to things with fear and fear confuses and confounds our understanding take for instance the recent outbreak of corona now you know there was a kind of all around from the media and everywhere it was like as if death is coming and dancing over our head so what was happening now fear gives a wrong signal to the body and the brain the brain and the body so what is happening due to fear the lungs were overreacting the immune system was overreacting it's like using a nuclear bomb right next door to your house to kill your neighbor i mean it's the most absurd thing one can ever imagine because if you do that you are going to be as much impacted so that's why in the beginning you saw many people dying which was not really necessary because the human body was hyper reacting there was a hyper inflammatory response out of fear the enemy was assessed because of fear it was assessed much more than what it was and of course that is thanks to uh, media thanks to the drug companies so that's a story in which i don't want to go but supposing you looked at it calmly you could understand very simply this is yet another virus human body has tackled multiple viruses from god knows baba adam ka zamana i mean at least 1 million years of human evolution even if you take the most conventional thing it is at least 1 lakh 50000 years we have evolved through countless things so it is another virus we can handle it human body is very much equipped it has all the information our Uh, you know white blood cells all the cells which are needed all the thing which are needed to fight all that was needed was to take rest stay in quietude and within us augment the healing power and to augment the healing power we need to put our mind on the right side of the game so what happens with stress the mind is taken to the other side and the mind in man is the leader before the soul emerges but that's may, may not be a subject for this evening but the mind is normally the leader of man is one of the upanishad says mana pran sharir neta so it's so important to keep the thoughts in the right direction if the thoughts say that well you are going to die you know what message we are giving to the body you are dead so when it says that you are going to die all the body mechanisms begin to shut down why because the mind has told you are you are as good as dead so either they panic or the body goes into a shutdown given up giving it up mode and the result is almost an inevitable degeneration you see there are very interesting studies with regard to this there is something called as mirror neurons you know you meet a person and you just simply say everything will be okay you will be fine so you have gone away with a smile and a cheer but this smile and these words will keep playing like a mirror in the person's head much longer so it's not about meeting few minutes whereas another kind of doctor who may say or a visitor who may say oh my god so dangerous you have corona you're going to now imagine the whole setup was like that he was completely isolated all masked with all those uh, coats what a frightening image this is so first thing necessary is to make the mind understand correctly any situation and the mind cannot understand if it is in a state of excitement and turbulence and agitation so the first practice if you really want to manage things in life is to stay calm in the face of danger how can this calm come this peace grow inside this clarity can come which comes with peace there are two possible ways of doing it or three possible ways of doing it one is exercise reason try to understand thing correctly now not pseudo reason pseudo reason is what we have gathered from whatsapp gyan but true reason look at things just as it is as i said in the case of the virus scenario don't go by all the studies this that and so many deaths look at it calmly and you will understand that human body is equipped to handle it why make such a big to do about it if if a calm reason can look at life it will be a great help second is 
if you want to look at things and understand correctly, step back from the whirlpool of life. If you are caught in the whirlpool, it will carry us and not be able to show us which way to go. We'll be confused, directionless, and eventually the boat will be, a boat of life will be carried towards the sinkhole. Whereas if we step back and look at things, so when we step back, this is an art, learning to step back. Don't react immediately. We, we react instantly to situations, circumstances. And this is something which can go on. It's like an endless learning process. So when we step back, then we have a better picture, a clearer picture. This in yogic parlance is called deepening the consciousness. We live on the surface. So what happens when we live on the surface? We are tied to 100 strings. One WhatsApp message comes and there is a chaos first within us and then in the community. Something goes on in the TV. There is a war which is taking place and everybody, oh my God, third world war, nuclear bombs are going to fly all around. Why? Because we don't know how to step back. And to learn to step back every day, we must set aside a time and we can practice this stepping back. So that's why meditation is important. Instead of being caught in the whirlpool of events, circumstances, running from here to there, all the time responding to this call, this message, learn to step back. Spend some time just to step back. Look at our own life. There are people who have lived a whole life and it's a pity they don't know why they lived. I've asked people, what was the goal of your life? And they come up with some of the silliest of answers that is possible. Well, we got married, we had children, I got a job, I got money, now my child is having another child, I mean grandchildren. Can you imagine? Is this a goal worthy of a human being? Animals also have this. They have a little den, they have a child, they have grandchildren. They don't make much ado about it because in animals the lifespan is so short that most animals will die without seeing a grandchild. It's only given to human beings. And there is a reason for it, but that is a thing apart. Why human beings are given the capacity to have, you know, uh, grandparenting. <laughs> it's like a course correction. You know, parents are caught up in all that excitement. Grandparents are supposed to have gathered wisdom and to, you know, uh, teach a, their child as he's growing up through the child that look, it happens. Don't worry. You also went through all this to reassure. But of course, some grandparents can add, you know, fire or salt to the injury, but that's the thing apart. So learning to step back is one of the fundamental practice and stepping back. What should we really, what is the question we should ask? Where am I going? What is my aim? You see, there are three questions which change the life of a man. T.S. Eliot, you must have heard it was raining and he suddenly uh, knocked at the door of a person because he wanted to take shelter. It was raining. Those were the days when not much questions were asked and he was let in. And the person who opened the door in a farmhouse asked him only three questions. Who are you? Where are you coming from? Where are you going? See, ask these three questions and see how your life will change. Who are you? Say that I am an ordinary person. I am at the mercy of life. I'm trying somehow to make both these ends meet and you're finished. What does Indian yoga teach us? You may be in rags, yet you are Brahman infinite. You are the divine in disguise. Just imagine the power of these magical words. We are all divine in disguise. And does the divine fear anyone? Not at all. This itself liberates us just to know that I'm not this struggling creature. Okay, that's my outer life. There is struggle there. There's, but this struggle, I can take it. Why? Because I am the divine in disguise. Nothing can destroy me. Nothing can, you know, come in the way. This orientation of the mind. So who am I? But if I say that I am the son of so-and-so, I am Mr. This, Miss That, I am my religion, I am my surname, I am my little state, I am my language. You see, I limit myself. All these are identities which I have assumed, but I am not these. Yes, they are important to me, but I am not this alone. I exceed all these little things that are part of my life. They are part of my life, important as they are for a greater purpose, which we need not touch here. But this is not me. Where am I coming from? From my mother's womb. That means I am a creation of 
material creation call it chance accident whatever so what's my destiny if that's my if i am coming from my mother's womb then my destiny is where will i go i will end up with the tomb this is the kind of unfortunate uh, you know a kind of negative pessimistic philosophies we hear man has come from dust he will go back to dust what does indian philosophy say oh man you are in a great journey this is one life but it's a journey of lifetimes where i have, have i come from you know i am tempted to quote one passage from shirobindo where he says night is not our beginning nor our end she is the safe mother in whose womb we have hid we have come to her from a supernal light by light we live and to the light we go we are children of god don't put that god into a religious slot then there will be fight between this god's children and that god's children but we are children of god just imagine what an empowerment it is i don't die with the death of my body and at the same time where am i going if i am a child of god i must become divine that's my inevitable destiny so while i am taking up a job profession marrying all that is there but that's not the real journey the real journey is taking place behind in other words through these questionings through this stepping back we discover that our life runs on two parallel rights one is the outward life event circumstances ever changing scenario people all these things are changing we can't make a sense of these changes isn't it but there is another life which is the inner lifeline no always you will see in pamish will talk about one outer lifeline and a inner lifeline they will say the inner lifeline support the outer if you have a strong inner lifeline your outer lifeline problems can be overridden that's how the pamish say and it is a deep truth of a being outer life is one but there is an inner life catch that thread there are instances where people were on the death bed and they came out of it simply by the power of this inner lifeline this inner lifeline we must strengthen and to strengthen it first we must have a clarity of aim if our aim is small do what you may life will be miserable if our aim is outer we'll always be at the mercy of circumstance and then we start doing things to tweak and twist if the aim is outer i want to become a let's say a big man in uh, industry want to earn a lot of money want to reach uh, the position of a ceo or whatever then what i'll do i will automatically begin to deviate from my true calling i'll start compromising i'll develop ambition i'll start pleasing people flattering people i'll be afraid of those in power and position start trying to you know uh, butter them or jam them or whatever else we can do and what will be the end result i would have gone far from my own true calling and this is what the gita says is the most dangerous thing in a man's life swadharmo nidram shreya par dharmo bhayava because we begin to live somebody else's life isn't it that's why very very few people live their own life because to live your own life you have to get free from all these little limited but what is that inner life inner life is the true calling of a man what you want to live for what is worth dying for is what is worth living for so every day we must sit for some time and raise this question to ourselves don't give a fixed answer i don't want to give an answer i have my answer and i'm sure there would be many who have a, your their own answer what is it in life that is worth living for and what is in this life worth dying for and you see you will see how your answers lead us to evolution so this knowledge which comes from going within turning within is so important whenever there is a little time you all get little time isn't it we all say we are running short of time no we are gossiping we are shopping we are doing everything except using that time wisely and to use it wisely is to spend some time with yourself we know everything about the world but you ask him what do you know i don't know myself and the same applies about having power you see the story of the buddha when ashoka meets buddha as the story goes and he says i am ashoka the great so well known so buddha says so oh, what are you he says i am an emperor what kind of empire you hold he says all this land that you see is my empire 
And when he asks Buddha, who are you? He says, I am also an emperor. What kind of emperor are you? He says, I am an, an emperor of my inner domains. So he doesn't understand. He says, what do you mean? He says, oh king, you are a king over the land that is outside. I am a king who has mastered himself. I am the king of my own nature. Just imagine the power of these words. And when we understand this process of empowerment comes as we develop the true attitude based on the real knowledge that we perception that we have towards life. What is that attitude? How see changing attitude changes the whole scenario. So there's a story of this man who is sitting in, in a, it's hot in a desert. He is sitting below a palm tree and doing something, probably eating something. And there is a king who is passing by and he looks at this man and says, who is this crazy fellow? And he has the court philosopher. You know what court philosophers are meant to do? They are meant to only flatter the king. So the court philosopher says, sir, you are such a big man, your highness. Why do you want to waste your time on this man? He says, no, but I am a bit surprised. How could a person live like this? What is he doing? So he goes to him and he asks, what, what are you doing? Who are you and what are you doing? He says, don't you see I'm eating gruel, dalia. So the court philosophers condescendingly tells him, if you only knew how to please the king, you do not have to eat this gruel all your life. And this man looks at him and smiles and says, if you only knew how to eat gruel, you would not have to please the king all your life. Look at the change of perspective. This attitude is so important. We don't understand the power of attitude. We go through the entire schooling process. Nobody teaches us what is the right attitude. Another very interesting story. You see, we don't even know from childhood. We are bombarded with the contagion of desires. If you have this, you'll be happy. If you have that, you'll be happy. If you have this, you'll be happy. We don't even know whether it will give me happiness or not. You see that story, another story, which I often quote, maybe all of you may not have heard, but some of those who hear me have heard this story, that a man went to a place where, uh, you know, a facility where people were depressed. And this inspector asked, why are you depressed, young man? So he was crying, Usha, Usha. It doesn't refer to any person, okay? So take it easy. So he says, uh, you know, I loved Usha and I couldn't get married to her. And then he says, yes, that happens. We love someone and we can't get married. So it causes distress. I understand. He goes a few beds for the, sees another man crying, Usha, Usha. He asks him, what happened to you? Did Usha ditch you also? He says, no, no, I got married to Usha and I'm depressed. And there's a third person who is also crying, Usha, Usha. And he asks, what happened to you now? He says, I don't know. I see these guys all the time saying, Usha, Usha. And I feel Usha is someone very desirable. And I am worried. I am so unhappy because I don't even know who Usha is. So this is called a life led by desire. You know the problem of desire? You are unhappy when you don't get it. You are unhappy when you get it. This is the old adage, buy happiness, pleasure through desire, get to pains free of cost. Why does this happen? Does it mean that we shouldn't have anything? No, we should have it. But it should be an act of love and an act of true will within. Desire means I want to hold it forever. This spirit of possessing it. Buy a very good sari from a store or a suit or whatever you want to buy. I mean, don't buy it, quoting me. But if you have bought it, what happens when you come? You have worn it. Now you want it to be appreciated. Nobody is there to appreciate it. What happens if it gets a little tone? Oh, such a nice thing. I bought for so much. What happens if somebody says, this was available in Saroji Nagar market for 500 rupees and you paid 5,000 rupees. 100 ways to become unhappy. Desire opens the doors towards that. Keep yourself with minimum desires, rather live with needs. And you see how joy will come regardless of wherever you are. So you have the story of this Diogenes. He's a great Greek philosopher, sage, and his followers till date. They were people who could live with great joy. He was that kind of a man, but he used to live in a very small place. 
So one day Alexander goes and stands before him and says, because he has heard about him. So he sees him living in such a meager way. So he asks that, who are you? I am Alexander the Great and who are you? So Diogenes says, I am Diogenes the dog. What does it matter? He says, oh, I see that you are living in miserable conditions. And Diogenes smiles and Alexander says, ask anything from me. I am the emperor. Ask and it shall be granted. So Diogenes says, please move out of my way. You are blocking the sun. Don't you see I am bathing in the sun? Uh, this is not to say that you should be like an ascetic. It's an inner attitude. If you have something, receive it as a gift of God. Gift of grace. You will be inwardly free. Not tied to people. Oh, so and so gave me this. Now I must return in the party in the next, his marriage with a bigger package. Things come not from people, but through people. And when they come out of you, also they don't come from you, but through you. Look at the wonderful saying of Khalil Gibran. He says, your children are not your children. They come through you and not from you. They are times, arrows going to their target. Who are we then? You are the bow person. You are the bow. That's all. And if you pull too hard, it will snap. Don't start playing this role too much. Some people start taking over responsibility of everything. They stretch the bow of life so much that it snaps. At the same time, don't keep it so lax that you can't even fire the arrow. This is with regard to children. Don't think that you can control them and you want to do everything they should do the way you expect. You will be miserable. A child has to blossom in his own beautiful way. But at the same time, if you become so lax that, okay, child is the freedom, whatever way, then again, you are missing the mark. Be the right arrow with the right bowstring. And therefore, from there comes one of the axiomatic truths of life, which we can practically take home. That axiomatic truth is the golden mean. Aristotle used the word golden mean. Buddha speaks of it as balance. A life of balance. So what are we balancing? Ask somebody. He'll say, I'm balancing between work and home. No, that's not what is meant by balance. Ask somebody else, what are you balancing? He says, I'm balancing the demands of my family and the demands of my friends. That's not about balance. Balance and harmony is about the different parts of our own being. So let's see what are the different parts of our being which we need to balance. Most of the time, we are balancing only our outer life. So that's life, life with its movement. It's one aspect. How about our relationships, which is about the heart? How about the mind? How about the body? How about the soul? All these parts, a balanced life means outer and inner. Both are in a state of perfect harmony. So while we lead an outer life, obviously, everybody must. We are not ascetics. Not meant to be ascetics, but inwardly also we must take time to grow within, inwardly. So some people will say, but there is nothing inward. If there is nothing inward, life is really not worth living. To live only for the bodily self, which is going to die and nothing is save this body and this breath. If that is the case, then very frankly, eat, drink and be merry is the only <laughs> logical conclusion. But if as mystics say, there is a deeper self. Pay attention to it. Let it also grow. It needs another kind of food. So that's why, see, how to first make these parts grow in power. The mind needs knowledge. It has a seeking for knowledge. Knowledge is not over when we have finished a course, when we have got a degree. That's when knowledge begins because then you are not constrained by this subject, that subject. Specialized knowledge is the end of knowledge actually, unfortunately. Because we have this illusion. I have done my psychiatry. I'm a psychiatrist, so I know. No, I don't know. I don't know 10,000 things that exist upon earth. So I should have this will and quest for knowledge from the smallest things by paying attention, by wanting to know. Simple thing like how a person hammers the nail. A very simple thing. Seemingly, but look at the person and you'll gain something. So knowledge, why am I here? Deeper knowledge, higher knowledge. Is there something beyond our intellect, beyond mind, beyond man? Is there really something called God? Strive to find out. So knowledge, to gain this knowledge, we can read books. At the same time, 
of course books is not about information books of knowledge are a different kind of books information google gives knowledge somebody who has processed this information and turned into mint of knowledge and then turn this knowledge into the real mint of wisdom so that's why one goes to sages seers reads the scriptures because it gives another kind of knowledge i may have all the knowledge of the world but if i don't know what my soul is how i should deal with life how to manage my anger then my knowledge is incomplete so knowledge develop this knowledge it's an empowerment love my heart how i should love people don't know all their life they are unhappy why because there are others they are complaining grumbling grudging so and so doesn't love me so and so doesn't love me at least you learn to live that's why when people are in depression and they say oh nobody loves me you know what cures tell them to buy a labrador or a golden retriever see how it will cure them they will learn to give love and they will receive or simply love a tree plant a tree water the tree let this energy of love flow it gives joy if you are missing on joy means you are missing on love and for love learn to love learn to give love not want love so this is not taught in our schools so the tapasya of love we can say then about life what is life meant for how to conserve the energies of life how to use it rightly and wisely it's a vast subject and i cannot enter into the details for constraint of time but it's in itself a whole science the science of living where are my energies going what are my choices what is dictating the flow of life and then of course my body we must pay attention to the body engage in some kind of exercises if nothing else do some cycling at home do some proper exercise don't get into this oh i am doing yoga most of the time yoga I keep it for old age this what is called as yoga i mean asanas so keep it when do something vigorous at least walk the best exercise half an hour walk you can do it anywhere it doesn't matter you can do it even in your house so when we do this and then catching the inner thread of life we are creating a balance in life in all the different areas and domains of a being some people become workaholics they're only working 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 so their life becomes imbalanced in one way some people are so lazy that they are always wanting to run away from work and just be at home that is another kind of imbalance correct these imbalances they create stress within the being because one part which is not active is in an inactive mode and the others are active the human body and being is interconnected so there is a stress within and it causes disharmony which results in diseases of various kinds so allow this develop give time to yourself to develop these different aspects of life learn to inculcate attitudes which are going to which, which should make you free how diogenes is free this is an inner freedom inner freedom means i don't depend upon anything you may have a whole world you may be a sage a seer governing the world you may be the emperor do it but don't do it with this idea that oh this is mine be free that tomorrow if you have to walk away from it you walk away with a smile that is what we see in some of our ancient stories the story of king harishchandra is of course one extreme the story of rama that today he has a whole kingdom he is going to be coronated the king next day he walks away with a smile on his face without holding any grudge or bitterness in his heart towards his father it's a tough life and most importantly take stress as an evolutionary challenge don't try to enter into comfort zones if you go into comfort zone for a moment you will be comfortable but life will knock at the doors again this time with a more terrible face because we have not taken the challenge life will come again and say are you ready now to take this challenge take the challenge of life and take it by empowering yourself by growing in knowledge by trying to understand every situation is something unique don't just accept it just at its face value go deeper into it try to understand take the help of people take the help of you know books take the help of introspection reflection meditation these are capacities given to man and try to become calm and when you do that then when you understand see what is of value in an event make the progress needed see when an event comes we are carried away by its world not realizing in that whole event one thing is of real value save that all the rest will pass away like a storm that has gone away 
so we must understand that every event situation circumstances comes to give us something like a grain of gold but it is surrounded by a whole heap of ashes pick out that gold it becomes your treasure personal treasure most important in life learn to wait and be patient impatient people life is not a mcdonald or kfc thankfully it is not you see the example of coal and diamond they are made out of the same basic substance carbon not only carbon the same way the whole arrangement of atoms is same why one turns coal coal is very impatient it doesn't go deep like us it likes to be on the surface and it says take me out take me out take me out we take it out what is the result it's worth nothing it can give some fuel of course but that's it it gives fuel with lot of smoke not a clear fuel itself and it burns up it becomes ash the same carbon says no i want to go deep into the earth bear its temperature doesn't break down and stays deep within and you have to dig out much with great difficulty what happens when it comes out it becomes a diamond if we are impatient in life life is shaping us there is a wisdom in life it is shaping us and we should be patient persevering like a diamond full of trust a personality of a divine type or even a higher kind is not carved out of a hurried you see when you have to make a uh, you know a gold ornament you see the process you dig out gold gold is mixed with so much dust you let it go through the purifying process then you set it to fire and then finally you carve an ornament give it small touches then it becomes an ornament we are meant to become such ornaments but for that we have to go through the process life comes with mixed baggage everything see out the unnecessary elements see out all that is not necessary for our progress towards our aim it's useless muck we don't have to start reacting responding to everybody and everything on the road and start you know uh, socializing one of the biggest bains we don't need to do that that is the unnecessary element see it out after you have sieved it sieved it out start purifying refining ourselves you see bring out the greater possibility the deep is such a beautiful learning simply how to speak we don't know how to speak and see speech causes so much distress in others and to ourselves so just learning to speak refining speech refining actions refining the way we wake up the way we sleep this is a whole art and science of living what do we do first thing when we wake up we are on to whatsapp or we are on to just spend just a few moments with gratitude thank you for this day i have another day to live life beautifully don't send messages just good morning good morning good morning send messages with goodwill because it's your work in the world when people wake up and see a beautiful message from you full of goodwill full of love it helps it's like a work of god it's not just a casual thing but do it as an act of love and of course i'm not saying that thousands of people you write a standard format and i spend about quite a few minutes on this message and people ask me why don't you make a standard format and send to everybody then it's no more a message it's a formality pour your heart into all that you do do it as an act of love and it could be the smallest of things or the big things do everything is an act of love it could be cooking a peel do it with love it could be writing a paper do it with love it could be listening and speaking facing a war being a hero leading an army running a kingdom polishing a shoe do it as an act of love bring out this love in all that one does so this is how from morning till evening so work becomes a joy why because it's an act of love and do it not for the sake of desire and what i will get out of work nobody can decide about the result it's a basic truth the gita puts it very crisply nishkam karma well does man have a choice do we really have a choice to decide and determine our results what is given to us is to do well 
that we must do when we are stressed by the anticipation of results it takes away half our energy i have had communication with some cricketers and all this. and you know one of the oh i can't bat well i get nervous you know why people get nervous because they are already anticipating results so what is, what is happening they cannot give their best to life to give your best to life be at the moment do it well people often ask how do i concentrate i don't know how to concentrate and then there are meditation methods sit like this do this mudra go inside you learn after paying 1000 dollars yet you cannot concentrate that is a simple way is concentrate on whatever work is at hand supposing you are eating chew well supposing you are you know speaking to somebody engage in that work it could be a physical work do it with utmost concentration what is concentration it's a disciplining your energy so that they are at the command of your will they flow in the direction that you have built concentration of thought that it will flow in the direction where you have decided not like in a table top conversation people are drawn by gossips of every kind so avoid gossip if you really want to grow in life that means all these social gatherings parties they are nothing but gossip worst kind of destruction of energies all kinds of interchange so learn to concentrate learn to see out and then finally balancing all these parts when we come to sleep sleep with joy in your heart why should you have joy in your heart the joy comes when you have lived a day well lived a day well has nothing to do with tomorrow when you go to sleep you should be ready i have done what i should do today and for tomorrow i am ready if tomorrow never comes i am ready most important in the end that which keeps us going which we do not ever grow and that is faith when we all knew that today we have a meeting at 5:30 we all said yes how did we know that we are going to meet this is called faith when a baby comes out of the womb it has faith so this faith ultimately we have in so many things situations circumstances the very stuff of our being have faith in yourself have faith in your destiny and have faith in god these are the three kinds of faith one must always carry with oneself faith in yourself faith in destiny faith in god and by faith in destiny i don't mean that sab acha hoga bahar se have faith that whatever happens will be good and if you have that faith everything will turn towards good and along with this faith if you're lucky to have this faith in that wonderful grace which governs life this is not something which one can mentalize but if you are fortunate you can do it by being in the company of those who have faith in the grace that's why satsang avoid the company of those who drag our energies in directions which are you know so many people want to drag us into directions where we just waste be in the company of those who uplift us who will help us progress so be in the company of those who have faith in the grace and if we can surrender to that grace then life will become beautiful a marvel and a constant wonder there will be not only no stress but every stress so called stress will become not just a challenge but a great opportunity to grow to close with an example from the mahabharata how did abhimanyu face what he faced isn't it a great stress seen from one way yes but he did it why he faced it by knowing it's his day his opportunity one day he has got his opportunity to fight with all the vigor of his soul and he did it and therefore abhimanyu never died you may wonder how his body died but abhimanyu became immortal people don't swear by the name of arjuna the great warrior arjuna was a great warrior <laughs> undoubtedly not a single warrior like him but when we will people talk about bravery and courage they say abhimanyu that was his moment what was the opportunity and the choice before abhimanyu go back into his comfort zone nobody was pushing him into doing what he did he knew he doesn't know how to get back he knew that he is entering a territory where anything could happen he turned his death 
into a means to conquer immortality till date abhimanyu is not forgotten never will he be forgotten till there is a single true kshatriya warrior in anywhere in this world they will swear by his name and follow his example they were great warriors they came and they went away that is what is called as turning stress or the challenge of life into a means of ascension and growth but for that one must know that body is not all if abhimanyu thought my body is all he couldn't have fought the way he did if abhimanyu thought my life is only for my wife and child he would have never been able to fight but at that moment abhimanyu said body life mind they are nothing i am a soul traveling on an upward journey let me take this opportunity and throw myself into the great fire of yagna sacrifice and through sacrifice emerge like the phoenix bird pure and strong and immortal thank you i think um, i could go on but let's have some questions ji ji uh if anybody has any questions small questions please ask anyone uh, any and any ask. problem uh, in asking uh, in english you can ask in hindi also no problem yeah uh, can i ask question ma'am this is ramya yes, yes ramya sir. yes uh, sir uh, good evening sir it's really great to have you uh, have you in this session uh, really it's very amazing words what you say what you uh give us give us uh it's really uh making us very light and i have one question like uh, how can you avoid feeling low or feeling alone or feeling low yes so uh thank you ramya for this question and for the beautiful words so how can you avoid feeling low whenever you are low when you are in a state of sadness say to yourself i am not this miserable creature i am not here you know sadness comes why depression comes depression comes from fatigue if it is fatigue take rest depression comes because we are not getting something which we wanted and supposing something you are not getting which you wanted say that it is not worth me to have this thing and say that divine knows god knows what is better for me he'll give me what i need and what i deserve so have this faith and through the power of faith come out of that second very simply there is a part in us which get depressed unlock it by taking a movement towards something which can immediately give you the sense of satisfaction in joy engage yourself in any activity which gives you happiness dance sing pray do anything which unlocks it's like suddenly it unlocks otherwise the mind gets caught into that single movement it's like whirlpool which is sucking you lower and lower go out take a walk meet friends anything so it unblocks that part and then alone remember two things in life which will always help one we are all alone we may have a whole family but there is a moment supposing one is going on the road meets with an accident one is unconscious who comes and helps we don't even know we are all alone but remember also the whole world is with us meaning thereby this world is not just a world of humans talk to everything make come make friends with the sun make friends with the rain make friends with the breeze communicate with it make friends with the trees see they will respond they are beautiful beings everything is conscious and living make friend with the frog on the road in in winters make friends with even the little worm look at it and communicate with the ant with the dogs cats whole world of beings and towards human beings also but most importantly when you make friends just give don't live for with a sense of want that will bring perpetual sadness again and again so how we also have our needs and wants where will we get them from so remember i am alone everybody is alone the whole world is with me but deep within there is a permanent eternal companion who walks with us 
and that is God. Make him your friend. Don't treat God like somebody on the pedestal whom you have to please with, oh my God, what not with, you know, arti and this and that and mala and money. He doesn't care about all these things. He has all of that. Give him your love. Say from today, whatever way you conceive of God, doesn't matter. Tell him from today, you're my friend. Tell him everything. Write, speak, communicate with him as if he is living because he is living and living right there with you. He is not only in some special places. He is with you, within you. And when you live like that, you see the magic and the marvel change in your life. You yourself will say how your life changed. I have seen people come out of deep chronic depression and all that advice was given to them. Make Krishna your friend and their lives changed. And another last way, whenever life makes one feels miserable, low, because I'm thinking of myself, see, when we are miserable, what do we think? My life, my, nobody understands me. Nobody feels somebody whom I love. He doesn't care. All these thoughts, all centered around. I make this eye so vast. Think of the vast universe. Think of how space is expanding into God knows where. Think of endlessness of time. This is just one moment. Lives we have left behind and lives that are going to come before us. And when we make our consciousness vast like this, depression will vanish in moments. So put it into part of your daily practice to speak to God as a friend. Not like he's the master. Oh my God, I should be afraid if I have done some sin. He doesn't care. He laughs at all these. Our sins are, he looks at it like stumblings of a child. So parents make the child get up. Okay, that's it. <laughs> they apply a balm and make us walk. Okay. Equally virtues. He's not impressed by our virtues. Can't Hello? impress him. Oh, I am such a goodie by. Make him your friend. Incorporate it from day to night. Make, make God your friend. And remember, even if everybody is around you, ultimately deep within we are alone and the whole world is with us. And make the consciousness vast in terms of time and space. Okay. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Well, Tinku, what's your question? Please ask. Hello, sir. Yes, hello. Yes. Yeah, my question is, uh, at one point of time, you said, you know, be in the company who will uh, uh, uplift us, right? Yes. So, uh, no, how Okay, I, I could only I could only I think there is some connectivity issue at your end. But Tinko, I could hear these words. How to be in the company of those who uplift us. Beyond it, I couldn't hear because there was some problem with the words. You can message in the chat box. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. So my question is how to identify such people. Ah, yes, I got it. So that's what I understood is the question. See, in India, Indian thought, that's why it is called as the value of satsang. And equally, the problem with dusang. So how to identify these people? Obviously, these people are found in the places which nurture such things. That was the original idea of, about satsang, not the what it has become now. But find a place everywhere. There is a place or a group if you are lucky to find one such person, you have, it's like special grace. But you can always find nowadays, at least in every city, every place, there are some places where the whole atmosphere and the kind of humanity which goes there, even if that humanity has a lot of defects, at that point of time, they bring out their best because they are meeting on a different matrix. So find places where there is a matrix of spiritual consciousness. And there, even if few moments you are there, spend some time there, maybe once a week and it'll uplift you. There you will meet some people who will be like very natural friends in your upward growth. Of course, one meets all kinds of people otherwise. And they help because they, help, they share your aspiration. They are not many. So obviously they cannot be found in the standard workplace. You may find them, may not find them. But there are places where the chances of finding a person who is having this kind of Godward aspiration or a higher aspiration. You see, otherwise in normal life, it's ambition, which kills all these deeper things and idealism. Stay awake from the company of these people. You may need them for work, 
okay in work you are meeting them but they don't make them your friends because they are ambitious people and they are living only for their own selfish ends but if you are lucky to find one such person in your workplace wonderful but mostly you will not find them in places like these there are as such few go to places where you may find them that is the reason why in india there used to be emphasis about teertha places where you are likely to find such people find them sit in their company that's why people used to go to the sages to the wise people so that in their company they could be uplifted and if you can't find anything be in the company of wonderful books they are a satsang so when you read a book from swami vivekananda you are in one way in the company of swami vivekananda read his letters you'll feel he's addressing to you of course you cannot talk and exchange there but it's wonderful company read the gospel of sri ramakrishna read books of the mother and you will see how everything grows and develops hello there's huh. one more how do we negative thoughts by honappa how do we control negative thoughts don't try ha ah, okay how do we control negative thoughts don't try yes don't try to control because the more you try to control the more terrible they will become because what happens is negative thoughts are uh, basically a way of looking at life they are a kind of attitude don't try to control them it's like saying that today i will not think of a white elephant instead inculcate positive thoughts so when you feel negative thoughts of let us say anger so if you try i will not get angry i will not get angry it will become more and more terrible but instead of that say that well i must have peace whenever you are filled with thoughts of hatred jealousies say that i must love so this is the way which is taught in in yoga and in real life if you say i will not hate i will not be jealous it won't happen instead say i want to love i want to grow in love so don't try to control negative thought rather inculcate the positive thought so every thought like fear instead of fighting fear grow in faith instead of fighting hatred grow in love instead of fighting agitation grow in peace got the point so don't fight a negative thought bring in the thoughts that will rejuvenate which are wonderful which will nourish and you see the negative will be washed away to take one example you don't fight darkness with darkness can you succeed no light a lamp light a candle so whenever you see negative thoughts are around you become the light light a little lamp and you see sooner or later that darkness will vanish okay so i would like thank to you, thank you sir alok. thank you i would like to thank alok Are... nothing else <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's very nice of you that uh, you i asked you just and you came and enlightened my, my children somebody is just writing subhashini procrastinated some task in one day i got stress on that day so please don't procrastinate anything what you have to do do it now actually yeah attitude. and if any of them have any particular questions they they can okay. feel free to write to you and send them by email and i'll be happy to answer okay okay so all are happy yeah. i think very happy ma'am yes ma so, very, yes, happy, ma very happy ma'am thank, thank you for the session so happy, sir yes, yes, very thank happy thank you sir thank you ma'am thank, thank you ma'am okay thank, thank, you. You, thank you thank you children bless thank you, you all thank you thank you, thank you so much sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir thank you ma'am thank, thank you sir thank you so much thank you so much thank you ma'am bye 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 everyone happy bye bye sound that the basket